There's one thing, there's probably more than one thing we didn't pay attention to, but there's one thing I am aware that we didn't pay attention to. What part of this problem did I pretty much completely ignore? I think we did radius. We used A for the radius. We didn't use 1 for the radius. But there's something else we definitely ignored in this problem. Circumference? Well, circumference, yes. But there's a, a speed is pi A. So the, let's see. We kind of graphed out the cosine and then this transformed cosine function that represented the height. But what we didn't pay attention to is what time, what t value, certainly zero t value is where we're starting at the bottom, but how long does it take to do one full rotation to hit the bottom again? Uh, just looking at the function here, two pi is the assumption I had made because I didn't pay attention to the horizontal stretch of this function. Now, is that correct? Let's look at the speed. So, is at 2 pi, did we do one rotation? So, let's look at, we do know what the speed is. Speed is pi a. So, let's put some units. Let's go meters per second. meters per second or miles per second, whatever you want m to be, I'll just use meters. So our speed is pi a meters per second. What we need to turn this into is rotations per second. So we have a speed is pi a. So I'll just draw the wheel, it's going to go that direction. I want to know how long until the wheel has gone one full rotation and ends up in the same position? Or I should say the same rotation, but different position. So how are we going to figure that out? What is the distance it's going to travel? So to travel the circumference distance, uh, and which would be 2 pi r or pi d. So that'll be 2 pi, wait, a is our radius, so it'll be 2 pi a is our distance. So 2 pi a equals distance in one rotation. So any questions about that? One of, so the, what triggered my spidey sense is I was thinking about what we weren't, the information we were not using in the problem. So that is what I was thinking about. Oh, well, how can we write the f uh, function out if we, if we didn't know what the speed was? So this is going to have most likely a scaling effect. All right, so we go that many meters in one second. So now, I usually don't like units, but we'll go with some units, 2 pi a. Uh, we're measuring in meters, so it's 2 pi a meters. That's the distance we just measured right there. And I want to know how many rotations, so we're going to go, we have pi a meters per second. Oh, that's you not going to be good. <laughs> Yeah, so we're about to have meters squared per second. Probably not great. So we'll use multiply by the reciprocal. Wait, what am I doing? What's our formula? D equals RT. Distance is rate times time. That looks good. So there's distance equals RT. So speed is the rate, pi a, meters per second. So we have 2 pi a meters, meters per second times time, which I, now on the left I have one rotation. So this is we time for 
one rotation. And that'll be in uh, seconds. So we just have to divide by pi a meters per second. And that'll give us 2 pi a m divided by pi a. The units get reciprocated, so it's seconds per meter. So our meters are going to cancel, pi a's cancel, so we have 2 seconds is the time for one rotation. So any questions how we get down to how much uh, rotation, how much time for one rotation? So let's correct our uh, vertical movement. So our vertical movement is the one we had was 2 pi was a rotation. So all we need to do is shorten it. So what I want we're just going to go 0 to 2 now. I'll call this function g of t. So there's our original g of t. So I want to take our function and compress it by pi. So the question is, do I write it as g of pi t or g of 1 over pi t? One of those two is going to be correct. So I want to, there's another way to figure this out. So let's try the first one right here. What is g of 2? If I plug in 2 for t, g of pi 2, that's g of 2 pi. That will give me the point right there at the bottom. So I'm basically just plugging in the value of 2 and then seeing where I'm at. And so I want to multiply it by pi. So I'm going to use the g of pi t, not g of 1 over pi t. So I'm doing a guessing and checking. I knew it was going to be a scaling factor of pi or 1 over pi. And I just tried the first one out, and it worked. Uh, now intuition is a little weird when you go to scale. It's always the opposite of what it looks like. So it looks like it should be multiplied or stretched by a factor of pi, but it's the opposite. It actually compresses, or it compresses by pi, 1 over pi when I do that. So that's the, if you want to think about transformations, that's what we need to be doing. So our proper function, so y is going to be, I'm replacing up here, our input's going to be pi t. So it's a times 1 minus cos of pi t. Right there. So that's our proper scaled height. So any brave students want to just take a guess at what the x function might look like just from what you know about y? Don't use more than two brain cells. Just be brave. What do you think is going to change? The trig function. Trig function is probably going to change to? Sine. Sine. So let's just try it and see what we get. I'll switch, I'll go to the green pen for guess. So this is our guess. So if I graph this out. Well, let's, let's do a little bit more intuition before, we may modify this a little bit. So if we think about the horizontal, it's going to start with a zero horizontal offset. I'm going to zoom in a little bit to the uh, to our original drawing. When we look at this, it's going to start with the horizontal offset of zero. And 
as our wheel rolls, let's pretend that we're on ice and it's just spinning in place. So it won't actually move at first. We'll worry about the forward movement later. So let's just pretend it's going to spin in place. Horizontally, it's actually going to go backwards a little bit. And then it's going to come back to the zero horizontal position and then it's going to go forward and then come back to zero. The sine function is very similar to that. So let's graph out the sine function and see what it looks like. Unfortunately, a sine function, the output's vertical, so we'll have to rethink it. So if I use y equals sine x, actually, let's use, I don't really want to use y's. Let's we'll look at the sine t function just on a regular graph here. Starts at zero, well that's good. So right away, what I want to do, or what I need to do is go backwards, not forwards. The sine function has positive at the beginning and then goes negative. So right away, I'm gonna make it negative, so it's gonna go backwards or down and then up. So that's the first thing we're gonna do to it. Like that. So we'll go back and then up. Do I need to worry about this shift, that offset right there? Should I be adding a constant to it? It's really gonna be starting, if we think about our wheel, it's gonna start at zero and end at zero. So we don't need an offset for this. So I actually don't want that one right there, so let's go ahead and take that out. So it's just going to be a times negative sine t. So I think that's a pretty good guess if our wheel's not moving. Uh, I could graph this vertically with the proper y equals a negative sine t. If I graph this out, I'm just changing this around to go down the y-axis. It'll look like that right there. So I'm graphing our sine function going downwards. If that maybe that doesn't. Oh, it probably should be going up. Let's just leave that original one in. That's too much confusion. All right, so that will take care of the offset, the horizontal offset. Now what we have to do is worry about the wheel moving forwards. So the way I think about this, think about the ground if we just keep the camera on the wheel and then the ground's moving underneath it. So just think you're just watching the wheel as the ground, your camera's moving with the wheel as the ground's traveling underneath it. When the ground's moving underneath it, that just has a constant speed that's occurring right there. And we already know the constant speed. Somewhere up here, pi a is the speed. So all we have to do is just add that speed in. So it's gonna be the speed distance will be rt, so it is speed times time. So we're just gonna add a pi a t to this. And that will account for that constant speed that's occurring. x equals a, so I'm just copying what we already had, negative sine pi t plus our rt, which will be the pi a t right there. So that's our horizontal part of the position of the uh, spot on the motorcycle wheel as it's driving. So this problem is tricky to solve. So the procedure I did is I thought about the easier one to do. The, hor uh, the vertical was only one thing I had to worry about, one oscillation. And then once I got that, I went to the more tricky one where there was kind of two components. There was an oscillation and a constant speed. And then I just kind of, I was able to get those independently and then combine them together. 
So you always want to try to go the most simple way first and then build off that. And I did a lot of guessing and checking. I knew the types of functions that oscillated, graph them, and then modified them off the graphs. So that can be very useful. And we'll just write our final combined answer. So we have x, y equals, so our x function is negative a sine pi t plus pi a t comma our y was a times 1 minus cos pi t. I could ask you to turn this into a rectangular equation, but that would not be fun, mainly because the only thing that would really make it annoying were these constants right here would be annoying. So we couldn't just square them, add them together. You get all these extra terms from foiling. That would be, get really annoying. So that would be not a very nice uh, rectangular equation. So I'm not going to do that step here. This one's just too complicated. Way better explained parametrically like this. So now we're going to get into some calculus. So you're going to find that this class we're going to do a large part will be basic, uh, well not basic, but it will be geometry. And then a large part will be calculus. So we'll do a whole lot of things like this where we're doing a lot of graphing and uh, it'll feel almost sort of pre-calculus plus vectors. So it'll feel very much like pre-calculus one and pre-calculus two, but we'll get quite a bit deeper into things. Now we're going to calculus, so it's 11.2. Calculus with parametric curves. So the first thing we learned in calculus was limits, but what was the when in doubt, what should you do in calculus class? I know this, you have to go way back to Calc 1. Take the derivative. So we're going to start with derivatives. That's a great place to start. So from before, we're, of course, doing parametric curves. So we have our x curve will be f of t, y curve we'll use g of t. So to find dy over dx, we're going to treat this just like a fraction. This uses the chain rule. We can Oh, I want to do dy dt. So on the left I want dy over dt. So we're going to find dy over dx and then multiply by dx over dt. And algebraically the dx's cancel out and that's why they're equal and that comes right out of the chain rule in calculus so you can either think about this algebraically canceling your dx's or you could think about the chain rule so either way so thus if i solve for dy dx algebraically i'm going to multiply by the reciprocal which will be uh, dt, or well, divide by dx over dt. So I'm going to divide by what I circled there. So we have dy dt divided by dx over dt. And of course, this is true when dx over dt is not equal to 0. So before when dx over dt was 0, we divided by it, we would say that's undefined. Let's think about what's actually going on here. When you see dy over dt at the top, the numerator here, that is describing how y changes over time. 
So that's how the particles rising or falling over time, if you ignore the x, the horizontal part. That's just the vertical rise and fall. And if we look at the denominator, that's the horizontal movement right there, dx over dt. What happens if the horizontal movement is zero, but the vertical movement, let's say, is positive? How would you describe the particle moving? Horizontal is zero, no horizontal, but the uh, y component is increasing. So we got a particle not moving left or right, so there's no left or right movement, but there is dy dt is greater than zero. Is the particle undefined? How can we describe that particle's movement? It's not moving left and right. It's going directly up. So it's just moving upwards. So if you get undefined in your derivative, what that means is usually it's either moving up. The other option is if the y component dy dt is uh, negative, it's moving down. So now undefined means it's most likely moving up or down. So we can get a little more specific when we say undefined. You can't describe it as rise over run because run is zero, but the particle will be moving up or down when dx over dt is equal to zero. So when dx over dt is equal to zero and dy over dt is positive, the particle is moving up. I'll just draw a little up arrow. If dy over dt is negative, it's moving down. And if dy over dt is actually zero, stationary. So that we got moving up, moving down, and we have stationary. We can't really describe these in our usual slope because the slopes rise over run and we'd be divided by zero. So we would, before we just call these undefined. But now with parametric equations we can get more specific and talk about upwards and downwards movement. So we're about to take a derivative of the derivative. So I want to know the y double prime, which we're going to write as uh, dx dx of y. So this is our second derivative. So we're going to take a second derivative. be the x derivative of the derivative or y prime so it's a little bit dangerous to write y prime now before let's talk about notation for a minute what did y prime mean before today. So it meant the x derivative. So it would have been dy over dx. Now we have a little confusion because if I just write y prime, do I mean the x derivative or the t derivative? So now there's different letters that could be taking the derivative with respect to different variables. So it's a little bit dangerous to write y prime. So we want to be a little bit careful. Uh, in the notes today, in the notes today, I'll use y prime as the x derivative of y. So when I write y prime, we mean dy dx. So y prime means the derivative. with respect to some variable, but you have to know which variable. So if you just see y prime, you have to know in the context, what is this with respect to? Uh, very soon, I'm going to be using y prime to mean the t derivative. So I just want to warn you. Uh, what do they use for a, in physics, your physics notation? 
So in physics, they use a dot to be dy over dt. So have you seen that before if you're taking physics? All right, so I'll try to do, is that super common in physics, like all the uh, time, or? More in, uh, not in, like, we just learned it in dynamics and stuff, so. Okay, I'll try to do. Double dots for second derivative. Yep, triple dots for third. What do you do for a fourth? Four dots. Though. What about a fourteenth? Hamilton <laughs> said he's only seen four dots like once. I think because so. then you get into jerk. At some point, was it goes speed or velocity acceleration? Jerk. I don't know what's after that. Impulse. Impulse. No. no. Snack crapple pop. <laughs> Somebody likes breakfast cereal too much. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, how the jerk changes. All right. So I'll try to use some dots. I don't usually use that before because I'm not a physicist, but I will try to do some dots when we do our t derivative. And then, uh, so whenever you catch me doing a, the wrong notation, if I'm doing a t derivative with a prime, let me know. I'll try to switch to a dot or vice versa. So this will be a DDT notation. Okay, so we got a y prime, which is the dy dx. So we're getting back to our second derivative here on the left. And we're gonna play the same game we did above so I'm just going to get that on the board for a second. Check is done. Oh, fantastic. So hopefully our projector will come back. All right, all I'm going to do is rewrite what's in the box with a dot over the y. So it's going to be just our dy dot over dt divided by dx over dt. And on the next line, I'm going to replace the y dot with that definition dy over dt. And then that last line is hard to describe. So we'll pause and hopefully our projector will cool off. Oh, sweet. Hope is on the way. So we're taking two derivative, two t derivatives of y. So that'll be y with two dots on top divided by dx dt That'll be divided by x with a single dot. So it looks like we're communicating with aliens. And our first, I'll be back here in a second. So this notation is a little hard to describe. So it should be back up. All right, so any questions on what you see? I'll go over it one, time, one more time real quick. So we have that dy at the very top, dy dot over dt divided by dx over dt. We just replaced y by y dot. So that's kind of just copy and paste, but our y is now y dot. And then I rewrote the y dot as dy dt. That's right from that notation. Then the bottom line, we're just taking two t derivatives of y. So I just wrote it as dt dt of y. And then 
last up, just got down to super lazy notation, y double dot divided by x single dot, right there. So I just wrote all the t derivatives as dots. So it's a little weird that the second derivative is y double dot over x dot. So that is right there, dy over dx. So now we're going to find tangent to a curve. Our curve will be x, y equals. This is a parametric curve. So x will be secant and y will be tangent. And we're going to have our t between negative pi over 2 and positive <laughs> pi over 2. And we're going to look at this at the point, square root 2, 1. So there's three steps we're going to do. First, find the t value. So right away, how can you tell I did not give you a t value? I gave, well, I gave an interval of t value, so the t value better be between somewhere between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So I gave you a point. It has an x and a y coordinate. I didn't give you a t value. So we're going to be plugging in a t value, but first we've got to figure out what t value we have. So we'll do that first. Second step, find the derivative, dy over dx. And then third step, get the equation of a line. All right, so let's go t-value first. This is pretty much just some trigonometry and some algebra. So we have square root two comma one equals secant t tangent t. So we have an x equation and a y equation. Our x equation is square root two equals secant t. Our y equation is one equals tangent t. It's easier for me to think about tangent values. Oh, well, secant's pretty easy too. I don't like secant, but I definitely know about cosine. So secant's one over cosine. I'll just rewrite it as one over cosine t equals square root two. Reciprocate both sides. And now it should be obvious what t value gives us cosine one over square root two got to be in quadrant 4 or 1. Cosine's negative in quadrant, everybody's, no. Cosine's positive in quadrant 1 and 4. So we'll have two solutions to the cosine equation, plus or minus pi over 4. So this just comes from cosine. There are two cosine values, one in quadrant 1, one in quadrant 4. So we get two cosine values right there. Pi over four, negative pi over four. Hopefully our tangent equation will narrow it down. Tangent is negative in which quadrant? It'll be two and four. So tangent automatically, the fact that tangent is positive, that's gonna throw out our quadrant four answer we got. So tangent is only gonna be positive in quadrant one. Hopefully, tangent pi over 4 is 1. So at pi over 4, cosine and sine have the same value, and they'll cancel out to give us 1. So tangent pi over 4 is 1. All right, so our t value is this pi over 4. So we have our t value. Now we need to find dy dx. So that was step 1. Step 2, dy dx. I'm going to go back up to the top and rewrite our formula to make it even nicer. So that's y dot over x dot. So it's the y derivative of t, x derivative of t. 
Could you look at the other box? Because down. Because you also wrote dy of dt. Or dy dx. Y double prime. Or y double dot over x dot. Should equals dy of dx. Oh, that should be the second derivative. You're worried about the right side here? Yeah. Yeah, that should definitely be it's the second x derivative of y. Absolutely. Now, it may seem a little not intuitive, like maybe I'm missing an extra dot over the x, but we worked all the details out, and it's just one dot over the x. All right, so we use that formula at the top. The dy dx is the y derivative of t divided by x derivative of t. And it should be pretty easy to take these derivatives. They're just regular trig derivatives. So it's y dot over x dot, or dy dt over dx dt. So our x function is secant, our y function is tangent. We're not doing the quotient rule, we're taking, it's the quotient rule in my dreams. This is not the quotient rule, this is the derivative of the numerator and denominator. So this is not the quotient rule. So derivative of secant, secant tangent, derivative of tangent is secant squared. So we get to cancel one of the secants with one of the secant squareds. So secant, the way I'm going to cancel this out in notation to be kind of lazy, I'll cancel the secant and I'm going to turn that two power into a one. So that's how I write the cancellation. So I'm dropping the power of secant squared by one. So we just have tangent over secant I think we have tangent and secant values already at the pi over 4. So there's our y prime over x prime, or I should say y dot over x dot. So new notation I'm going to add in, vertical bar, t equals pi over 4. So this vertical bar means evaluate at that t value. It looks kind of like the vertical bar you use when you do an antiderivative, but there's only one value I'm plugging in. So we're just going to plug in that uh, right there, t equals pi over 4. So this notation means evaluate at t equals pi over 4. So it's tangent pi over 4 divided by secant pi over 4. And I think we already computed those guys. Let's see, secant was square root 2 and tangent was 1. Oh, that's very nice. So we got 1 over square root 2 is our slope of our tangent line. So that was step two, we know the slope, and then all we need is the equation of the line, which is step three. You can use any of the forms you want, or you can use the easy form. So point slope, if you know a point and the slope is the easiest. Everybody's obsessed with y-intercept, but if you don't know the y-intercept, well, the y-intercept's not the most useful. I would go point slope. We know point, we know the slope. So let's use the easy one. So our y coordinate was one. So we got y minus one equals one over square root two, x minus, uh, our x naught was square root two. If you really want point slope form, that's fine. I'll add the one to the other side, distribute. So 
y equals 1 over square root of 2x. So I'm going to go to what's best for graphing. I think Desmos will be really good for parametric equations. So look up Desmos. There's my keyboard. There we go. So it naturally goes into rectangular. Uh, coordinates and what we want to do is add in somewhere in here's an option function I'm going to do parametric I don't think it's in that setting nope I'm going to projector mode though There's a way to do parametric equations here. This can't be the most efficient way. Parametric. Oh, we just have to use all these extra parentheses, it looks like, although it just deleted, move that down. All right, so if you want parametric, make to each coordinate function of t. Okay. So that's pretty close to what we want. We wanted secant t, tangent t. All right. Negative pi over two. Two pi over two. And we'll add a function. So our line function. Alright, so there's our parametric curve. Our line function will be, keyboard please, there we are, y equals 1 divided by square root 2 x. Oh no. I'm supposed to touch it at one point. That's not good. That's not one point. Yeah, it's supposed to be tangent at one point. It was was it, it was secant tangent? All right, let's do point slope form. Maybe my algebra. Y minus one equals half. Parentheses. Is it x minus square root 2? Mm -hmm. Nope. Yeah, I didn't think that would fix it. So our slope looked like it is wrong. They are, at least they're intersecting. Well, it looks like they. They're not even intersecting. Oh no, do we do our. Square root 2, 1. Is 
So it looks like they're intersecting. Yeah, this not give me exact value, but square root two is really close to 1.44. So it's like they're intersecting at the right spot. So our slope is wrong. So let's go back and see if we can fix our slope up in one minute. Look like our slope should be steeper or a larger value. Ah, I see what we did wrong. That's incorrect. What's wrong there? Secant tangent are swapped. We did the dy over dx, or we did dx over dy. So we should get the reciprocal. So that would reciprocate everything and our slope would be the reciprocal just square root two. So we just did the reciprocal of what we should have gotten. So we'll run right back to Desmos. And oh no, I just deleted the whole thing. All right, we'll do the simple one, y equals square root two x. Oh, that was with our, I'll go back to point slope. We hit put the wrong one in, so of course we would get the wrong thing out. <laughs> oh, perfect, the projector broke, all right. We'll have this graph up tomorrow at the beginning of class.